What are some of those misconceptions you've seen around not just esports, but even the industry? I want to differentiate between esports and just playing a video game. I play video games for fun, so I'm not downplaying that at all. But esports is organized, it is structured, you practice, it really does look like a sport team. Mm -hmm. It looks like those things that you would expect in a sports setting. You're coming to practice three days a week, four days a week. You're playing games one day a week. You have film review. I mean, wow. we really do a lot of the same stuff that you would expect from sport. And so it isn't just unstructured play. Welcome to On The Move from the Texas A&M Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management. In this episode, one student shares how her sport management courses have helped her outside the classroom. Howdy and welcome to On The Move. I'm Chelsea Reber and today I'm visiting with Patrick N. Neff. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So tell me a little bit about yourself and how you are involved with kinesiology and sport management here at Texas A&M. Sure. So I am a uh, PhD candidate here at A&M. Um, I got into this program uh, about two and a half years ago. And I kind of came about it in an odd way. I was a uh, middle school and then high school teacher, and I got involved in an esports program, um, first starting one at uh, my high school, then going to the UIL and trying to convince them that they should take it seriously. Because of that, introduced to some other teachers that were also interested in the same thing. And we came together, formed a, um, a group, and then eventually a, a 501c3 nonprofit and started offering competition between students. And I started running into a lot of doors closed in my face, but uh, at schools that just think video games are a waste of time and they're bad for students and things like that. And I couldn't, I could give them anecdotal evidence that my program is seeing this and this program is seeing this, but I didn't have data to back up the fact that we were seeing positive outcomes for students. We were seeing grades coming up, attendance coming up. And so I looked around and nobody was doing that research. And I thought, well, I'm somebody, I could do that research. And I started looking for programs and uh, really connected with the faculty here and got some really good feedback and some ideas. And they said, we can help you do that. And so I stumbled into this kind of. So did you ever expect to go back for your PhD? I think in the back of my mind, I thought I would go back at some point, but okay. I was thinking, you know, I wanted to finish, um, at least the 10 years for loan forgiveness. And, and like, there were sure. some other things I had kind of on my plate. And I was like, I'll do that. Like, you know, I say second career, probably like fourth <laughs> at this point, but it was a long-term idea, but it wasn't something I was in a rush to do. And then when COVID hit and everything shut down, esports really was one of the few things that could still happen. And I saw how important it was to our students. And I thought, this is too big of a deal to let it just sit and hope. And so I thought about it, but I was never thinking sport management. My background isn't in sport management. And so it would not have been on my horizon if not for A&M and those, um, the, the faculty members who really made it possible. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that, the connection between esports and sport management. Cause I don't know if I would have, I thought maybe visualization or you sure. know, that kind of program, but, um, where do those two worlds kind of intersect? So it's interesting because, you know, there's this ongoing, um, conversation. I actually taught a class today and we had this debate mm -hmm. of is esports a sport? And there are very strong opinions on both sides. Sure. Um, and I'm not going to debate that right now, <laughs> but, um, Sort of the the feeling in the field of sport management in recent years has been that question is both important and doesn't matter because we are in a position, we are in a spot where we are the best capable, best prepared people to manage this growing thing because the thing it most resembles is sport. Um, and you look at other countries where it's further along, South Korea being probably the prime example, the most successful league in the world is the League of Legends Championship Series in Korea. Okay, The guy who runs it has a master's in sport management, works for a sport management company, mm -hmm. and his company was hired to come in and build this league from the ground up. And they are hugely successful because of his sport background, because they understood how to build an audience. They understood how to build fans, how to build out the teams. And so we are in a position where we are really well situated for that. If you're interested in the design of games and the background, yes, Visualization Lab would be a perfect place for that. If you're interested in, um, you know, the broadcast stuff, there are other places for that. But for the actual like front office management of building these leagues, of running these teams, 
we're it. We're the best situated to take advantage of that and to really help build that out. Well, all of those words you're saying, leagues, teams, Mm -hmm. coaches, like that's, if you were just saying those words, I'm thinking sport. He's talking about a sport. Well, and I mean, if you look at these organizations, take Optic Gaming in Dallas, for example, they have nutritionists on staff. They have personal trainers on staff. They have, like, it's not just kids playing video games, there's a whole apparatus around them. For every one player, I've seen graphics that say, you know, there's 40 jobs in esports for every one professional player. Because you have the broadcast side, you have the development side, you have the coaching side, you have the fan engagement, you have merchandising. I mean, there's so many, just like in sport, there's so many careers around that professional player. So even if you're not that person who can play at that high level, there's still a way to be involved and bring your passion to the table. Yeah. So let's back up out of the professional world because I know that what really, really got you back to work on your PhD was kind of that K through 12 younger people. So why are you passionate about that? And why is it important for for you to spread kind of the word of esports and why it's beneficial for those younger, that younger demographic? There's really a couple of reasons for it. Uh, The first, obviously, I was a K-12 teacher. I lived in that space. Um, I I specifically taught technology classes. So this kind of fell within my realm. I had a computer lab and I saw kids, they get so excited about gaming. And so it was a way to connect with students and especially there, there's different organizations out there that have put out data, and I've seen numbers as high as 70, 75% of the students who participate in esports. It's their only extracurricular with their school. It's the only thing that connects them to their school community. And it allows them to be part of that community to connect with people who they would never otherwise come across. I had a starting uh, captain from the football team, one of the defensive linemen, was one of my best players. Sitting right next to him were kids that were in the engineering program that would never play a sport. And they connected and they could communicate because they had this shared passion. It's a thing that I would have done at the age. Now I played sports. I did. I, I came from small schools where you did everything. Everything, yeah. But if esports had existed, that would have been my area to excel. I loved games. I was super into them. I'm still super into them. Um, I'm one of those old people that still plays way too many video games. <laughs> but like, this is a thing that I wish it had existed when I was that age. And so to be able to offer that to that next generation. Because I believe in education. My mom was a decades long educator. And I just, I believe in the value of education very greatly. And if it's something that can help us reach kids that aren't gonna necessarily be reached in any other way, I think that's not only worthwhile, it's imperative that we do it. Well, I've always thought I played sports growing up and that was a huge reason why I loved my high school Mm -hmm. years was because of the teams, the teammates, the coaches, even practice, like sure. all of that made me want to go to school. Now you are giving those kids who aren't necessarily athletes in the traditional sense, a reason to want to go to school and get good grades. And I'm sure it all connects. Absolutely. Which leads me to my next question. So what, tell me more about your research specifically that you're doing here in the department. Sure. So there's really um, a couple of things that I'm very interested in. The first um, kind of my area that my dissertation is going to be in, I am interested in these esports organizations like the one that me and some other teachers started here in Texas, for example, we, you know, we're, we're educators. We, we don't have a business background. We don't know how to build these things from the ground up. And so we kind of stumbled through it and we learned from other organizations that started before us and other organizations that have come after us have learned from us. And so there has been this sharing of knowledge, but there's a lot of growing pains. There's a lot of um, mistakes that are still being made. There's a lot of steps that still need to be taken. You know, we're in a couple hundred high schools in Texas, which is huge, and also 10% of the high schools in Texas. So there's a long way to go to get where we want to go. And so a lot of that research is around organizations and how do they gain legitimacy? How do we convince stakeholders that this is important and valuable use of resources? How do we grow what we're doing without those growing pains and without those stumbles. And so I do research on the organizational side, everything from organizational leadership to structures to what can we do to make the case, what communication is effective, those kind of things. And then on the other side, I'm also very interested in getting that data around student outcomes. I want data that shows the things I saw. And I've talked to too many coaches to believe it was just my school or that I was doing something special. It's, I'm seeing it everywhere, but we need those studies on paper. And that's a process anytime you're working with uh, students and grades and things like that, 
we're very careful because you want to protect the students' identities and their backgrounds and all of those things. And so we're very careful about how we approach that, but we want to build that data out as well. And so I'm also interested in research like that. And there's other research being done that's not my area, but that's very interesting. Um, but those are kind of my things. You mentioned that you chose A&M because to come back and, and do your degree and do this research because you could feel that you were going to be supported. So how has the department helped you in that research and kind of helped you succeed and, and, and kind of reach those goals that you had for yourself. Sure. I'll tell a, a kind of a funny story. Yeah. I, when you apply here, you go through the faculty and you look for people who might have similar research interests or anything and nobody really lists esports. So sure. you look for things that might kind of overlap. And my advisor, uh, when I first reached out to him, we had about a 30 minute zoom call discussing it. And one of the first things he said to me was, I don't care about esports and I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> Which might sound like a terrible start to the relationship, sure. <laughs> but what I, the reason I, I say that is, uh, the relationship was. He said, "You know esports. I don't need to teach you about esports. You don't need me to know about esports. You need to learn these other skills. You need to learn to do the research. You need to learn how to, you know, understand what a theory is and all of these things." And so. He said, I'll teach you those things. I'll give you all the tools where you can go out and study this and be successful. So I don't need to care. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck with me. And it's true. He does not care about esports yeah. to this day. Um, but he's been phenomenal in helping me reach those goals. And the department, they fund our travel to go to conferences. Um, we go to conferences in numbers where it's so funny because there will be more of our grad students than some faculties can produce. Mm -hmm. And we're, pre we're presenting more presentations than any other program in the country. We are dominating these spaces because we have the resources and the funding. Mm -hmm. We've got a travel budget that's better than some pro professors have at other programs. I mean, it's, and then they do teach us how to do research. They teach us all the skills we need and they provide us the resources to go out and do it. And that's, not everybody has that. So I know Texas A&M has an esports club, so mm -hmm. they have kids, students who are involved in the actual playing of esports. Absolutely. Um, what is the overlap between your students and those students? And, and is there an overlap? And how do you kind of work together um, so you're both working towards something? Sure. So it's funny, um, you know, it's an entirely student run club. Okay. Um, and they they raise their own money. They they put together their own teams. They hold their own tryouts. They do their own training. This is they basically have a faculty sponsor, one person who represents them for the school. Sure. And that person is effectively on paper a person, and then they do everything. Okay. And so it's amazing the stuff this team has been able to do because they don't have a ton of resources yet. They don't have a ton of funding and things like that. So they do it all themselves, and it's. I mean, when I was 19, if you'd put me in charge of anything like that, it would have gone nowhere. Yeah. And so to see the successes they have is really awesome. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of overlap. Uh, the president of that organization, several of the officers are actually sport management majors. Okay. They see the value in what we're doing because they want to work in that field as well. And so um, we communicate with them. We've done research with them. And we, I personally have worked with the club and, and done some mentoring and, and just kind of helping out where I can. I'm, you know, most of what's happening, they do entirely on their own and they don't need me, but I occasionally know somebody they don't or something like that. And so we do stay connected. And like I said, having those students that are in leadership in that club also be our students is a good sign that they see the value in what we're doing as well. What are some misconceptions that you have seen or heard? And you even kind of mentioned one at the very beginning. A lot of people think, oh, video games, lazy, you know, teenagers who spend hours and hours and hours playing video games. They can't be good for their brain, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those misconceptions you've seen around not just esports, but even the industry of esports? Sure. Um, well, so, yeah, the first one um, – I want to differentiate between esports and just playing a video game. Okay. Um, I play video games for fun. I so I'm not downplaying that at all. But esports is organized. It is structured. You practice. You are it. As you mentioned earlier, it really does look like a sport team. Mm -hmm. It looks like those things that you would expect in a sports setting. You're coming to practice three days a week, four days a week. You're playing games one day a week. You have film review. You have, I mean, wow. we really do a lot of the same stuff that you would expect from sport. And so it isn't just unstructured play, which is fine in its own setting as a recreational thing. But for esports, it's about improving. It's about competition in the same way that sport is. And I talk to those positions 
nutritionists and personal trainers, it's not 10 hours a day sitting in front of a screen. It was when it started. A lot of the earliest pros just sat and played. And what was happening is at 22 years old, they were blowing out their wrists so bad they couldn't play anymore. That's wild. I mean, yeah, you were yeah. having performance yeah. injuries and they were ending their careers in their early 20s. Yeah. And so you've seen a movement towards how can we avoid those things? Because it's a lot of repetitive motion. It's yeah. the same way that a pitcher is going to blow out their shoulder or their elbow. You're going to see some of that in esports. It's different, but it's it overlaps. And yeah. so I also think people need to understand that it's a high stress, high competition, and not just anybody could pick up a controller or a mouse and keyboard and do it. Yeah. These are incredibly <laughs> talented. I mean, the reaction speed alone, the the reaction speeds that we see at the highest levels of play are within a few tenths of a percent of the max that we see in human capability. Sure. Like it's ridiculous, the hand-eye coordination, the capability. And then there's a lot of strategy and a lot of thinking. And so I, I think the biggest misconception is just that it's this lazy doing nothing. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. I also think there was some misconception in the industry side, especially in the early days, that anybody could jump in and make a buck. And so we've seen a lot of leagues pop up and fall down. We've seen teams get started and get reorganized. The um, I mean, the Houston Rockets started a team of League of Legends, which you wouldn't think would align with yeah. the NBA so much. They did it for a couple of years and sold it oddly enough, to another NBA team, the oh. 76ers, who still own it, but they tried and it didn't work because they couldn't find an audience. Okay. And so there are also, like, it's a more complicated industry. You don't just jump in and make money, but people see, oh, it's growing 30% year over year. We just got to get in there and we're going to make so much money. And that's not what it is. You need structure. You need organization. You need a lot of the skills that sport managers have. Okay, this is kind of random, but I think – so sometimes I've heard like ballet can be very beneficial for professional football players, professional hockey players, things sure. like that. Could esports or some kind of play, video game play, be beneficial to – an athlete, a more traditional athlete, because of that timing, that hand-eye coordination, you know, something like that. Is that is that kind of research that may be done or is being done? Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's doing research along those lines, but I like that idea. Um, well, <laughs> Just so, like your non-traditional training sure. that could help in uh, other ways. There are some non-traditional pieces using okay. virtual reality okay. that's really coming in. Um, Stanford started doing it in the early 2010s, I want to say, maybe a little before that, where they happened to have one of the best VR labs in the world. Sure. And so they got in touch with that, and their quarterback, specifically their backup quarterback, was taking snaps virtually. Mm. when they couldn't take them in practice. Sure. And so they could see coverages, they could diagnose them very quickly from a first-person view without, A, there's no chance of them getting injured because they're not actually going to get hit. Um, but also, you can't always have the, that second-string quarterback getting first-team reps. Right. And so when they I, – I read about this. Um, they had a quarterback – their starter get injured, and the backup came in and was blowing people away with the way he was diagnosing coverages and things. And they said a lot of that – like he talked about it, that that VR experience really did help. Yeah. And so I do think there's some interesting applications between sport, virtual sport like VR and eSport and some combination of those to build skill sets. Yeah, that's awesome. What does the future of eSports look like at Texas A&M in your mind? So um, I have a little bit of insider information, but um, I also have a lot of hopes. And so I think, you know, the the school has talked about wanting to get into esports. They've talked about wanting to promote this. And so there has been kind of a focus on this recently, and I think they see the value in it. And so I see a future at AM where we build a top of the line facility for esports that is one of a kind, that is something nobody else has done. That it's one of the best things about AM is we have the ability, we have the resources, we have the support to do things that if we're going to go in, we're going all in. Yeah. You know, we don't build small buildings. Right. And so um, building this facility and then bringing the, this club in and really sponsoring it and supporting it, giving them a place to practice, giving them a place to play, giving them a place for fans to come in and cheer them on, um, the ability to host events, all of that stuff I see as a big part of what AM can do. I also see more dedicated classes focused on esports. I think sport management is moving in that direction of having maybe some dedicated esports management courses that would prepare you for the esports world to give you some special skills that you're not going to get just anywhere. So what advice do you have to potential students who are interested in not necessarily playing 
being a player, but mm-hmm. something like you're doing more interested in the industry of esports. I have a couple of things. The first is find what it is you actually are interested in doing. Mm-hmm. It's such a huge industry. We've talked about it already, but there are so many possibilities. If you're into digital photography, or if you're into videography, if you're into graphic design, if you're into broadcast, broadcasting, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. The, all of these are careers that exist in the esports space. And so you can take that love of gaming, that love of esports, and apply your skill set to it and go out and do something that really Um, both benefits the industry and benefits you. The second thing I would say is go somewhere that's going to train you with a wide array of skills. There are programs out there that have popped up, um, sometimes at for-profit places, that'll say, oh, we're going to get you a a bachelor's in esports, which doesn't mean anything. And nobody takes it seriously. So go somewhere like A&M, where everybody takes A&M seriously. That that Aggie ring, <laughs> I, it it opens doors. It, it really truly does. is gold. <laughs> yes, yes, and we have Aggies in the industry. We yeah. have people coming out of our club going straight into jobs with teams all over the world. We have people that go and work for the leagues. I mean, it's so there are connections there, and so I think coming to a place like A and M, getting a degree like sport management or communication or whatever it is that is within your wheelhouse that will set you up. And then the third thing I would say is stay involved. Um, there are opportunities to participate. There are opportunities to volunteer. There are opportunities for you to just, I mean, if you're into broadcast, broadcast your own stuff with YouTube, with Twitch. It's so democratized now. Anybody can be a creator, but you've got to take it seriously and you've got to put in the time. You can't just throw out whatever. You need a portfolio that you can go to an employer and say, look what I can do. And they go, we want that rather than well, this is garbage. Please move. Please yeah. leave. <laughs> and so, you know, take it seriously and put the time and the effort in. Learn those skills and then apply them. And I think that's really some of the best advice I could give. And then finally, because I know you're passionate about it and this is what brought you here, what is your message to educators, especially in the K through 12 sector, about esports? And if they're even kind of on the fence about maybe trying to start their own club at their high school or at their middle school, um, what is your message to them? And, and, you know, what would you like to see more of, especially at that level. So my message would be, um, to steal from Nike, just do it. (laughs) Um, it's, there are so many reasons you can talk yourself out of it and it is such an awesome experience. It's so beneficial to your students. And honestly, it's fun to do and to be that person. I would also say, and this is such an important piece, you don't have to know much. Mm. Um, I think a lot of educators are not gamers and so they don't, they feel like they're not qualified. What students need is a an adult that cares, that's willing to show up. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, the resources are out there. My own organization um, here in Texas, we we provide trainings, we provide resources, we will help walk you through the whole process. Um, And that's true in other states as well. There are a ton of educator-run organizations that have resources that will help you get started. And so if it's something that you are thinking about, if you're on the fence about it, if your school is considering it and nobody wants to step up, take that step, be that person. Because I have kids that still reach out to me from that program because I was their coach. I never taught them. I never had them in class. I never, you know, but that, that one hour, hour and a half a day after school where they could come to my room and it was a space where they could fit, where they had a spot, where they could make new friends, where they could participate and represent their school and compete. You were a sports person. You know this. I was a sports person. There's nothing quite like putting on your school's colors and representing your school. Absolutely. And if you can give one more kid the opportunity to do that, that is the difference that can make is immeasurable. So that's my advice. Just do it. Well, great stuff. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you so much for listening. Please consider finding out more about the Kinesiology and Sport Management Department by clicking on the link in the description below. Thank you for listening to On The Move. You can catch our episodes while you're on the move by going to Spotify, Apple, or Google. And to learn more about the Department of Kinesiology and Sport Management, head to knsm.tamu.edu. This podcast is housed in the School of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University, where we transform lives.